Uh, let me introduce myself first. I'm Chris Moore. I'm from the state of Texas Radiation Control Program. Uh, I've been there for quite a long time now. I think it's like 17 years. Uh, I do emergency planning for a lot of the non-nuclear power plant, although I've done plenty of that too, but uh, for Pantex, I've done planning for that, and I do all the RDD and terrorism stuff and Homeland Security. I'm also an incident investigator. We have a program in Texas just for, uh, we have so many incidents that we have people assigned to that. Uh, myself and Ray Walker, who's on the executive committee for NRAP, uh, the two of us have done quite a lot of focusing on community reception centers. I mean, we all started with, you know, doing at nuclear power plants and at Pantex, but we've done uh, exercises or tabletops from El Paso to Austin to Waco to Harris County to down the valley, all over Texas. It's a big state. I mean, heck, it, we've done, uh, you know, when we have a reception center exercise in El Paso, uh, Tanya lives in LA, lives closer to El Paso than our inspectors in Beaumont, so it's that big of a state. Uh, we still have, uh, I think, Dallas, Fort Worth, and, and San Antonio are kind of our holdouts that we're targeting to do reception center exercises there soon. Uh, a lot of you guys are in the nuclear power plant industry, and, and you run a reception center, but uh, we really want to focus on, you know, how many people we need and how are we going to do this? I mean, I think about Nissan Stadium out here in Tennessee where the Titans play 70,000 people. If they're there at a game, football game, and something goes off, an explosion, and everybody runs like crazy to go home, and then you find out it was radiation, uh, where do you think you're going to set up a reception center at? Because some of those people live in Chattanooga, Knoxville, Alabama, and so on, and so uh, the vision, you know, the way we run exercise is that, you know, especially like at power plants is that we set up a reception center on a different day than the actual drill using some of the same people. And uh, what we've learned from, has anybody done a non-nuclear power plant reception center in this room? Raise your hand. Ah, not too many. Uh, every time we do it, we realize, wow, we need a lot of people. Matter of fact, I'll say that a reception center is probably the most difficult uh, part of a response to uh, get enough trained people to operate, but it's really important because, you know, the public in the long run doesn't really care about ground zero as much as how did it impact them and their families. Uh, I mean, I'm one that's gotten calls from, you know, incidents that happened back with, Ru you know, the poisoning of the Russian or uh, Fukushima. We have concerned citizens. And so, and it's not just the citizens that were there when the, at at the event, but it's somebody that drove by on the freeway that says, I want to be monitored. So a population monitoring center is a huge, big deal. And if you go back 15 years ago, many of us, we all we heard was, don't worry, the fire department's going to set up some decon out there and they're going to hose us all down. It's just not reality. And in fact, uh, the reception center we're going to talk about uh, is something that you're going to set up and it may be open for weeks. Uh, so we're going to talk about in this module about communi uh, communicate the purpose of the population monitoring, summarizing the elements. We'll look at the roles of flow, the flow diagram and how we're going to document information. You know, honestly, this guide, a lot of you guys already picked it up, uh, the population monitoring guide from the CDC. You can download it. Uh, I tell cities in my state that don't have plans, which is a lot of cities, and you have a lot of cities that don't have plans either, I say just in time, you can download this and set up a reception center. It may be a painful process if you've never done one, but everything is in the guide to set up a reception center. Now, there's nothing wrong with uh, a city taking this guide and modifying it for their city. You know, they can pre-pick some locations that they'll operate CRCs, but uh, they can just take this and go, they can go right there and set one up. Uh, this was published, uh, it's been revised at least one time, and what we're gonna do is go, we're gonna do an overview of the portions of the guide. Uh, and I think some of you already grabbed some, and I know there's about eight more copies up here. If you wanna grab one, you can take it with you. They're freebies. Uh, <clears throat> we are gonna discuss uh, the population monitoring elements. Uh, how do we determine the need for medical treatment? Uh, how do we find contamination on the body or clothing? Is there a potential for internal contamination? And then uh, we'll look at removal. And then there's a section on dose and health risk assessment. And then how do you track this? You guys all know if you had any response with COVID, if you helped out your states, we just 
kept creating more and more Excel spreadsheets on what we needed to track for everybody. I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, after the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, the United States government tracked every Japanese citizen in those uh, countries. So very interesting. So you know that if we have our own uh, uh, dirty bomb go off, we're going to track every individual and we're going to follow up with those folks. Uh, planning, uh, the size of the incident is a major consideration uh, for planning. Uh, one of the questions, you know, one of the key things is you have to scale up or down based on the number of people you're going to monitor. You can get into an event, like we had a, we had a contamination incident in uh, Harris County in Houston where we had to monitor 160 people. That's not that many people, really. And so you could set up a, uh, a level of contamination, a very low level. But as you, if you had to increase it to 10 or 20,000 people, you would change your numbers. So this, you know, the, the survey methods, the screening criteria, that's all going to come into effect. We have so many different people in here, like the DOE guy. What's your, uh, what's your limit on contamination at a DOE facility if somebody gets contaminated? If background was 50 counts per minute, what would you say that you would decon them, a person if, if they got up to what level? Catch you off guard? Oh. Anybody ever in the Navy in here? We always have Navy people in the nuclear power. Any, any Navy people? Well, in a summary, you had to decon somebody if they got twice above background. Uh, nuclear power plants, a lot of times it's twice above background. How about a CRC for a nuclear power plant? What's one of our magic numbers for that? Anybody remember? 300, 300 counts per minute, right? So, uh, Anybody read the RDD guides? What do the, some of those guys say? Anybody know? If you have a large group of people that you might use as a, a, a limit to decon people. Anybody, anybody read that before? 10,000, yes. So you see all these numbers, and so I can go into any community. Yes, sir? 50 counts per minute. Right. So you're very, yeah, you'll, you'll measure your background in a clean area and then determine from there what is a level to decon. So the planning, my point behind the planning is uh, there's a lot of experts in our industry and I can ask different people, what should we decon to? And I'll go into a location and they're like, I don't care how many people there are, our rules twice background. And I'm going, okay, well, good luck on that if you have 20,000 people show up. And so you need to then, and you know, one of the recommendations, I think it's in the slide here, is talk to your state radiation program for their recommendation based on the size of the population that you're going to monitor. And you can scale up and down. I mean, clearly, if I had to monitor just five people, I'm going to, I'm going to decon any contamination of those people. But as the number goes up, I'll change the value. Uh, so it's prioritization based on the individuals and, and the resources you have also. Uh, the more resources, then the more capability and the faster you can get through this and you, you can get down into lower numbers. So it's kind of a competing priority thing uh, based on what you have available. Uh, the reception center is located outside the impact area to provide members a place to be screened. Uh, I think we talked a little bit later about communication, but it, but it was mentioned in one of the previous uh, presentations that, you know, this may not be set up for 12 hours after an emergency. And so if something happens at a football game at, you know, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the public's all going to scurry. They're not going to hang around the, the stadium, and so they're going to go home. And so you have to, public messaging will be a key thing there. Uh, and then eventually you'll let everybody know uh, as the question was before, uh, that there will be a, uh, a place to go the next day through messaging. They'll tell you where to go, and then they can go to that reception center. This picture is uh, just showing uh, there's a virtual community reception center. If you just Google CDC, virtual CDC, I can't make it run up here because there's some kind of issue with Adobe uh, Flash going on, I guess, since the beginning of the year or late last year or so. I think the only way to run that virtual reception center is to download the whole program, which I can't do up here. Uh, but it'll run you in uh, virtually into the reception center. Uh, but what we'll do instead is we'll look at uh, just kind of the zones and 
I bet you that's probably pretty hard to see in the back right there. So uh, we'll do our best to talk about this. But a reception center has a what's called the contamination control zone, and then later on we'll get into the clean zone. And in this case, in this flow diagram, you'll sh it'll show. I don't think there's any way y'all can read that, is there? Okay. So the, clearly we need to have some handouts with this. Uh, Oh yeah, there are there's a few over here. Yep. Now I can read it because uh, you know I you know I need reading glasses. Uh, so I'm just going to use this up here. Okay. So you're going to do initial screening and sorting. People are going to arrive, and you're going to you're going to greet your guest. And uh, what you're going to determine is you know who's highly contaminated, who had, looks like they have less contamination and then you're gonna direct them into where you want them to be deconned. And some of those folks, for example, if they have a medical issue, we'll talk, you know, we'll talk about that in a few minutes, then maybe they'll go to first aid before they get deconned. And then some of them will go into a wash station if it's clear that they are just heavily contaminated and there's, you know, you're just gonna move them quickly through any kind of screening and get them into a uh, shower or to dry decon. And then the majority of people are gonna go through contamination screening. And that's going to be uh, the stations that we have in the contamination control zone. The good news is more and more of us are getting a lot of portal monitors. It used to be the only place you could get an emergency response portal monitor was a couple for each CRC at a nuclear power plant. Uh, but now, for example, Los Angeles Public Health, uh, Tennessee Public, uh, I think Tennessee has 13 to 15 portal monitors. Uh, we have several at the state of Texas, but we have uh, regions throughout our state that have portal monitors that are ready for emergency response. And so we'll, we'll, we'll move them through that. And then uh, after, and we're gonna go through each of these stations, so I know that was kind of quick, uh, but after they go through these contaminated areas, they're gonna cross an imaginary boundary of a clean zone where you don't expect them to, there to be any contamination. And at that point, that's when you really finish your registration of all those folks that go through uh, and then after, and then when you go through registration, you make a determination. Did you have a question back there? Yes. Considering that we are primarily concerned with alpha and beta contamination, at least from nuclear power incident. Right. Would you say that portal monitors are effective in capturing that, knowing that a lot of them only capture gamma? And if they are not, what is a way to monitor people for alpha and beta. Okay, the question is, she's concerned about the type of contamination, alpha, beta, gamma, that a person has. What we know is, is yes, you're right, portal monitors are set up for uh, gamma, x-ray type, they'll pick that up also. Uh, it you have to make the determination on the incident uh, on the, what was released. For example, if you had a cesium which is my favorite thing to use for a dirty bomb, uh, you're gonna have some beta and gamma, and you're gonna pick it up through a portal monitor. Uh, you know, we get wrapped around at Department of Energy in Pantex. It, if you guys aren't familiar with Fan Pantex up near Amarillo, that's where all the plutonium pits are stored that go on nuclear weapons. And so, it's primarily an alpha emitter, and everybody gets wrapped around the actual that we have to find the alpha, but the facts are, it's not pure plutonium, you know, 239, and it's 40 years old, and so it's gone through a lot of decay scheme, and pancake probe does great, and, and portal monitors will pick up uh, the uh, gamma and X-ray energies off that. So if you get into an incident that you say, hey, the only thing here is a pure alpha emitter, you're right, then you can't use a portal monitor. And in fact, uh, you, can use a, you can use a Pantex probe, but then there are other alpha probes that work better. So you've got to... That's again where your state radiation program needs to make the best decision on how you monitor people. Does that help? So yeah, it gets complicated. Uh, let me go back and uh, let me finish up the clean zone and we'll go back and talk about each of those stations. So we're gonna go through registration process uh, and then there's a section of uh, one of the other stations is called radiation dose assessment. That's really designed and we'll talk more about that do we have people that were concerned that got a large amount of exposure or maybe a large amount of internal exposure? And then do we need to do follow-up? So we'll talk about that one. And at the end will be a discharge station because remember the people that come to reception center, 
they may also, this may be an impact of an area where maybe their homes were at, and now they can't go back home, and so you've got to have a system of, well, let me vector you to the Red Cross, let's get you housing, uh, or those that need uh, medical follow-up, or maybe they, uh, you know, maybe there's some uh, folks that are just so stressed out from what happened, they need some uh, mental help in this case, and so you would have a lot of that at your discharge station. And then maybe if you throw in some cookies at the end, the kids will like it, so they'll go through without complaining. We did that in Amarillo one time. We told the kids, if you just go through all this, then you'll get a cookie at the end. So that worked out good. It worked great. Uh, PPE, we talked a little bit about it. Uh, the guy, population monitor guy, does have a, uh, some recommendations at some of the stations. Uh, man, we all have difference of opinion on PPE, especially like firefighters, but uh, a, when you go through the first part into the contaminated zones, uh, I don't know if you can, that's probably not much better, but the initial sorting, first aid wash, contamination, all these folks need some type of PPE. Uh, you can decide on how much you want, uh, but some of the recommendations up here would be uh, initial sorting, uh, you know, booties and gloves, easy to work with. Uh, contamination screening, same thing, if you're standing by a portal monitor or you're using uh, 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 a pancake probe, you can just do that. If you're going to be somebody that's involved in the deconning and washing or, uh, or, or using wipes, then that's when you get into, we recommend gowns, face masks, eye shield if you think you're going to be splashed. And then if you have a first aid section, same kind of thing, uh, uh, gloves and shoe covers, because maybe some of that first aid is, they haven't even been, been through the decon because they're not ready to go. If somebody's uh, and I'm not even talking about life-saving. If somebody's extremely uh, nausea and can't stand up, you may have to do some triage before you can actually decon those folks. I've seen a lot of our reception centers. Uh, they set up a first aid tent, and they have, a, they have a meter over there just to protect themselves also. Just remember, this is a guide, uh, this book, and it has a lot of good best practices in it, but it, you can modify it based on what you're comfortable with in your CRC. Initial sorting, uh, think of a long line of people and, they're, and you're trying to head them kind of towards portal monitors. Uh, there is some information in the guidebook that says that if you didn't have portal monitors, then you, would, you, you might not even do a full monitoring of some of the people. Like if, if somebody says, well, hey, I've already taken a shower at home and I, I left my clothes at home in my washer and dryer so I could put more contamination down the drain, that's okay. Uh, those folks uh, may not need a full monitoring. They might do a, you might do a partial uh, monitoring, but if you have uh, portal monitors and you believe that uh, you know, it's gonna detect contamination on folks, then as this line heads towards the portal monitors, just look, go down the line and look for uh, any immediate medical needs. If you need to pull somebody out and get them to first aid, uh, folks with high levels of contamination, uh, there's a lot of ways of doing that. You can have somebody that just walks up and down the line with a, a pancake probe or even a rat eye, and if it alarms, and then you know you can ask somebody, well, where were you during the explosion? Well, I was 40 feet away. Okay, well, I'm sure you're going to need a shower. Uh, and then you can, as special assistance, uh, language issues. Uh, yes, ma'am. Is there any concern for if your policies say, you know, all evacuees will go through a portal monitor from the electrical company standpoint of liability, if you're deciding, you know what, you probably don't have a lot of a lot of exposure, let's monitor you a different way. Is there a liability concern? For a portal monitor? No, there's no liability issues, but uh, you can get all kinds of people that show up and don't want to do certain things, and that's why you would have like a somebody that leads the CRC, like an incident command person, uh, and those are great scenarios, right? I've had people that come through these, uh, I don't wanna be monitored. You can't make anybody get monitored, right? I mean, you can tell somebody that they can go home and shower, and they're probably gonna get rid of, because we all know that if you remove the clothing after this, 90% of your contamination is gone. You can also, if somebody says, I prefer to have somebody do, a, I've, you know, I've done a lot of research on the internet, I'd rather have a, somebody do one of those wands, and well, you can do that. That's not, there's no problem with that. Uh, some of the other special assistance issues, language, uh, depending on where it's at, uh, you gotta be ready for that. I mean, if you had something at Amarillo, and 
I'm just using that example. We have meat packing plants uh, that are close to the power plant. Well, you go in there and you find out that the people that work there are, you know, they're from Samoa and, or Somali. And, you know, I'm, I'm not talking just English versus Spanish. And so uh, I saw in Harris County, they had a, they had a phone set up at the, uh, before they went there for the portal monitor, and you could, you could dial the number and you could get any language you wanted. There are services that will find an interpreter and you can talk to that person at reception center. So that's, a, that's another thing to think about. And again, this already washed just means that it really depends on, uh, again, you gotta be scalable and flexible. And so if you have way too many people, maybe if somebody's washed, then you don't need to go through the full uh, uh, wanding of them or through the portal monitor, you can just do a partial. So again, just be flexible in those respects. First aid, medical care, set up a medical care triage uh, at the location. We know that if you have a, 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 a dirty bomb event or event from power plant, if somebody's injured, they've probably been transported by EMS, uh, but you, it doesn't mean that you're not gonna have problems at a, a community reception center especially if you have a thousand people that show up and it's hot outside, you know, you can have all kinds of issues. And so set that up and the screening can be done in coordination. Like I said, uh, one of the examples I saw in El Paso is they didn't get to go through the normal screening process. So they, at first day, they screened them there. And so they just did the screening there while they checked them for their other vital signs. Uh, for screening, uh, we like portal monitors because there's, you know, there's two different types out there. There's types you can walk right through, and then there's types where you just stop for a second, it beeps, and it lets you go, and then it alarms. It's a go, no go. Uh, if we don't have that, then we all know that a good uh, handheld meter takes about four to six minutes per person. And so we're going to talk later about how long does that take when you have a thousand people or a hundred people versus going through portal monitors. Uh, again, you can go to a partial screening method if you have too many people or you have people that uh, say that, hey, I've already been showered up and I, don't, I just want to come check myself here. And this could be day three, day four after the event. Then you can do hands, the standard hands, face, shoulder, head, and feet because if you don't have contamination there, it's likely that it's not somewhere else. Uh, we talked about re release criteria. Again, work with the radiation program for guidance. Uh, based on the CRC and how many people and how long it's going to take, uh, you know, we already talked about the fact that we may have to work this thing, you know, just during the day or we may do it overnight with shifts. And so uh, we'll, we'll pick a good criteria uh, to take to look at people. Any questions? All right. Going good. Yes, sir. Cool. <laughs> and how it affects everything. So. Uh, one of the things that we recently found uh, just trying to order gloves, you know, your PPE, and suddenly we couldn't order gloves for... There was a shortage of gloves, and in fact, during COVID, we gave up some of our gloves in our program to COVID, but now, I don't know, I got to be honest, everywhere I look, I see boxes of gloves. We have warehouses full of equipment, so... We're gonna, they're gonna, in three years or five years, somebody's gonna say these aren't any good anymore. So there's, there's plenty of that out there right now, but it is, it would be a competing issue for sure. Okay, washing. Okay, uh, targeted decon. Uh, you know, really we are, we have moved into, and even fire departments uh, have moved towards that, you know what, we don't need to get somebody soaking wet all over the body if they have contamination, we really need to target it to the areas of the body. Once they go through the uh, portal monitor, if they get an alarm, then we immediately vector them over to somebody with a, with a uh, frisker and we determine where on their body it is. And then if it's just on the left hand, then we decon the left hand. Yes, sir. Another thing uh, from my previous experience with portal monitors is they were very sensitive to radon. And uh, people that, uh, used like hairspray, mousse, uh, wore polyester a lot, had a high incidence of radon, very likely that's, that's set correct. the portal monitor off. Portal monitors could lie on radon and, and my hair gel that I use and the other things. And so we'll have to just, you know, if they, it's a quick thing to look at and say, hey, uh, you're wearing kind of a polyester jacket, can you take that off and go back through? 
or they're going to get monitored like everybody else uh, for contamination. We used to have them basically just wipe their hands down and then try it again, and that'd usually be enough to wipe the charge off. You know, yeah, get rid of the charge. You, you build up a charge, and then you may you may alarm the poor monitor. That's correct. Uh, we're going to target the de decontamination. Uh, we're going to do is uh, we're going to try to minimize the number of people we put through showers. Uh, I think I have a slide next about the dry tea con. Uh, personal items are contaminated, that's a big deal. People don't like to give up their stuff, and so you need to have a system to bag it and tag it with their name, and then you tell them that you're gonna get it back later. If, and again, this is one of those areas where if somebody says, oh, I don't wanna give my watch up, then don't take their watch, try to decon it the best you can. You can't force anybody to do anything they don't wanna do. Uh, uh, but if you can bag it and and separate in, segregate, segregate it into like a trailer or to a room, and then later on we can work on deconning and get their material back if they want it. Uh, options, uh, localized decontamination, you can do partial, you know, really wipes are just a great thing. That's very common now. Matter of fact, I've told that, I've been told now that they're, they're lo starting to look at bio and chem uh, going towards dry decons and wipes instead of full showers at this point too. It's just a good practice. And then if you do full showers, warm water, uh, I mean, if, if you set something up outside, I mean, I've seen where the fire department, they don't hose people at full pressure, but they can make like a shower. You can do that, but uh, depends on the weather outdoors, right? If it's warm, I mean, if it's hot out, I mean, cold outside, I don't want to be showered down outside. Yes, sir. To that point, I ran, we ran into the planning issue because a lot of people might use schools or high schools. Right. And one of the things that shocked me, schools are going away from showers because they're not requiring PE anymore. That's or right. they don't want to, I guess, make somebody uncomfortable getting a shower, so they take showers away. So if you thought you had showers before at your school, you may not know. You're right. A lot of schools, are, uh, especially elementaries, you won't find showers there. Uh, I think you still find them at most middle school and high school. Uh, the other option you can do, uh, I think they did this in Amarillo, is that they, they have a monitoring set up, but then they bring in decon trailers, and the trailers have sinks set up on the outside, and they can do dry or partial, but then if somebody has to shower, they can go through a decon truck. And you would be shocked at how many uh, agencies actually have these decon trailers out there. And so it's all about leveraging what is in your community and being prepared uh, because really the reception center requires a large number of volunteers, professionals, workers, and you got to build a plan for your area. Uh, and so, if, you know, if you decon somebody after a couple of wash cycles, then there's always the possibility it's internal contamination, right? That's one of our key things is that I keep, I keep deconning these folks, but they're still like 20,000 counts per minute. Well, then, then you can ask questions like, uh, and most likely they have some, they breathe it in, and so there's probably gonna be contamination in the nasal cavities or in the mouth, and so those folks are the kind of people that we're gonna follow up with. We're not gonna just say, eh, it'll go away. We'll, we'll send up uh, going to a doctor or medical facility for follow-up. Pet services, uh, there's a lot of, everybody has different opinions on, but uh, you know, most states are like, you know, pets or family members. I mean, we have rules in our in Texas where in a hurricane they get to get on the bus and get evacuated. Uh, I I think that pets are are when you decom. I think usually you need to have the the owner with you. I don't want to decom somebody's cat. I mean, that would be a bad situation, man. And I think that. Uh, you know, some people would argue, well, uh, you know, Whoa, what about the owner getting a little bit of contamination? But I think people care about their pets enough that they're not going to worry as much about that. And you can give them some partial PPE. But I think you're going to have to set up an area that's separate uh, for the pets and then uh, support from the owners and then have a holding area for them. Uh, and, you know, maybe they're not just a cat and a dog. Maybe it's a surprise cow. Good luck, right? But it happens. So in our state. So just that, there are programs out there like, uh, look, I can only speak for my part of the country. Uh, Texas A&M is like a, they're one of the gold standards for pet Con, and they deploy all over the state uh, and they would probably go out of the area. They have experts, they have 
They built devices that you can put a dog in and then it just sprays them from all ends or a cat and then uh, you gotta dry them off. It's pretty good. It's good stuff. Yes, sir. Of interest, uh, recently uh, in 2020, the uh, Louisiana Department of Agriculture and Forestry and the Mississippi Board of Animal Health yes. released a household and pet service animal reception and uh, care operating guide for radiological instruments. LA did, uh, Louisiana did that? All right, well, let's all look that up later on Google and look at there, because we you got to leverage everybody else's stuff. It's good yeah, stuff. The one I have is in draft form, so okay. I don't know if they've released a, oh, this is not a draft form. Yeah, I have a copy. Have okay, a copy. I'd like to see that later on the break. I think we're going to stop in like about five minutes for the, because I don't think I'm going to finish. Uh, registration. This is uh, data collection is key. Epidemiology is not the responsibility of emergency management personnel or fire department or law enforcement. But what you find out is that, wow, in the public health world, there's epidemiologists like crazy, well paid during COVID, I'd say, uh, the ones that did uh, infection. But epi tracking is a big deal. And so you need to grab folks in your city and county that are epidemiologists and get them to be part of a CRC to collect data, because that's what they do. Because you're gonna have to do some follow-ups after the fact. And these folks work in a clean zone, they don't have to be trained in radiation or wear PPE. We're gonna stop in like four minutes for that stuff out there. Uh, now, how you do this is gonna be up to you. Uh, we ran uh, exercises in Harris County and El Paso with CDC there to collect data, and we learned that this is the slowest part of a community reception center is collecting data. So everybody went through and they went through the portal monitor, oh, you're clean or you're dirty or contaminated and then this long lines. That, and I know in Harris County, which is a big county in Houston, they were overwhelmed by how many people they, they didn't have, they needed how many people you would need to operate two or three reception centers just to collect data. And so there's, elect, there's electronic data and there's paper uh, registration forms. Uh, I'll be honest, uh, in the long run, it's all gonna be electronic. Uh, you can take it, this is just a sample form and everybody has their own forms out there, but you can do one or two page form and you can have the, you can also have the picture of the body uh, to, for those that got contaminated to show where they got contamination on their body. Uh, you know, if you collect paper forms, then you check them out, then that stuff can be entered into electronically later. Uh, the other option is the CRC e-tool. This is all online. It's, it's based on an EPI 7 platform, whatever that means. And uh, that is for collecting, analyzing, visualizing data. You can set up a network at all the uh, reception center uh, locations at monitoring, at the wash station, at first aid, and they can enter data on each patient, or uh, not patient, but person that comes through the population. Uh, that, cannot, that can be run on laptops, uh, cell phones, and tablets. Uh, that is probably, that's the gold standard if your city and county have a well-trained epi staff that says, yeah, we'll roll in and do this. If you don't, then it's probably not going to work out. Uh, all the information on how to use that tool is on the, on the CDC's website. There's a deployment guide, there's a user guide, uh, they even have just-in-time PowerPoint training, which you're going to be doing a lot of just-in-time training for reception centers. And then, uh, there's an e-tool in there. So again, this is the gold standard, but you have to have, I recommend that you have uh, trained EPIs and volunteers that are ready to use it and say, oh yeah, I can do this. If you just set up a CRC at the last minute, it's probably gonna be uh, very difficult to operate. So we'll move on to radiation dose assessment. I would say this station, of all the stations in the CRC, I don't like uh, organizations to get too wrapped around on this because as you read the guide, it talks about you might do samples and you know your analysis and you, you might need a certified health physicist or a doctor. It really depends on what you can get. Uh, the key here is there are gonna be people at your reception center that you're really concerned about. Maybe you monitor you know 150 people and two of them or one guy had 100,000 counts per minute in his face. Well, then we all know that that person, they, they could have potentially inhaled uh, a large amount of contamination. And maybe we decon them and we don't see any more contamination on them, but we think they need some follow-up. 
So we would take them over to this station and we would ask them some additional questions. Where were you during the event? And uh, you could have specialized equipment if you had the right folks, you know, like if you were at a, by a large medical center and they had a, it, there are machines out there that will monitor internals for contamination, but if you don't have those, then you get a really uh, experienced health physicist at the state level or, or, or a physician, and they interview them, and they're like, you know what, we need to do some follow-on with you, so I want you to either A, go to your doctor, uh, make an appointment, or B, I want to send you to this hospital, and we can do some specimens, some blood tests, and urinalysis. You don't have to do all that at the reception center. So I've seen some concern with locals about, I don't know who's gonna do this for me. So just, again, just have somebody there that can, you know, that can do further questioning, you know, document it, and then have follow-up. Discharge, you're gonna have a uh, facility where uh, people leaving the CRC can get referrals if they need to go to alternate care sites, hospitals. Uh, you can have Red Cross there if you need to do, uh, as like I said, if they need a place to stay, or maybe the state has somebody there, you know, and they've set up hotels. Uh, and so you'll have that, this will be in the clean zone, uh, one of the last places. It's a good place to hand out a basic document about uh, radiation information. I mean, you're not gonna give them an education while they're there, but maybe you can have a two-page handout that talks about the basics of radiation and, and when you should follow up if you have certain symptoms. Uh, we really don't expect many people that go through a reception center to be heavily contaminated to the point where they're gonna get sick. And I, I, a lot of you guys, one of the toughest battles you face, not just with uh, the public, but even like EMS is, wow, this person has 100,000 counts or 200,000 counts, is this gonna affect people around them? And there's just no, there's no history of that ever for an incident where a person that's heavily contaminated is a danger to others. Uh, we try to get this uh, to our EMS folks all the time. They're like, well, they need, they need to be decon first. And I'm like, well, not really. If it's a life-saving, you need to get them and go. And so these kind of things come up. Uh, volunteers, this is the key. You know, if I had to walk away from NREP, I think the thing I'd like to take away for all of you is that a lot of you that do power plant response, I think you need to expand your horizon in your CRCs on who operates those things. Too many of you guys are using plant personnel or state personnel or emergency management. You really need to get your public health involved. And you need to get volunteers in your community to operate these things. Uh, you can use uh, folks, you can, you can take anybody and say, look, your job is to go up and down the line and see if there's any special needs. Uh, you can, uh, to interact with the population, to make them feel comfortable, uh, another thing they can do is just tell them what are you going to go through in the next 30 minutes to two hours, depending on how long it takes. So you can have somebody that walks up and down the line uh, discussing, you know, what's going to happen next. And then somebody else could work uh, like the line with the meter, just looking for any excess of contamination. So that can be another volunteer. So that means you could take any nuclear med, med tech from a hospital and use them. Uh, for screening, uh, Typically, portal monitors are set up by the folks that bring them, but you can have somebody like this lady that's here. Her job is to watch people go through the portal monitor, and if they alarm, she says, okay, go this way, because we're going to monitor you uh, with a pancake probe. Well, you won't say that, but something like that. And then if, they, if they're clean, you'll say, please go this way and go to registration. And so you can just direct them to the next station. Just have folks to direct them. Uh, decontamination. These folks probably need a little more training. Uh, what we do in our state, I tell uh, cities and counties that you're responsible for setting it up, but I'm going to provide you with two state personnel at the CRC, or maybe three, and they're subject matter experts, and they typically will walk around and see how things are going at the monitoring station, at the decon station, and, and, and help folks like that. Or they may get wrapped in, they may get pulled into doing a station, but we try to provide a couple of experts at our, our reception centers. Uh, you can get folks that are comfortable, they can assist with the partial decontamination, uh, or again, they can just direct people. Uh, okay, you're done with the, your decon, now you need to go here to, the, uh, to do your paperwork. And then finally, registration, interviews and data collection. Again, none of these people have to have any uh, radiation background. Uh, you can use EPIs, uh, public health, if you have a public health department in your city, 
uh, or you can get any, any other city or county uh, departments, they can all, you can train those folks on how to do the interviewing and the data collection. Let's see. If you do have a dose assessor, uh, you could use medical staff or a health physicist. Maybe one of the, maybe you got a guy in your program, uh, if you're at the state program, he's just a, he understands, he was a, he worked in nuclear medicine and now he's an inspector, then he's probably a good guy to use for that. Any questions on those uh, roles? Oh, last one, discharge. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Um, for the follow-up, the only people who really need follow-up are those that had to be decontaminated? Uh, you don't have to follow up every decon. She asked, is the, do you only follow up with the decontaminated people? You don't have to follow up with somebody that maybe had contamination on a hand. The follow-up would be the ones that had a large amount of contamination, like whole body, or a large amount in the, usually like in the face area, or the ones that you decon twice and they still have contamination, which means indication of internal. So those are the phones you're definitely. Now, look, it's very possible that your city and county decides that we're going to follow up with every single person and check on them. I mean, you can do that, right? So I'm wondering if it would be make more sense to have Registration does, I think uh, liability, you're gonna have to register everybody. That's just what it comes to. Cause look, I mean, uh, we know that whenever there's an event, somebody's gonna say they got sick from that event, right? I was driving down the road and then I saw this and I saw smoke and then I threw up that day and you go to the reception center and they have no contamination on them because they were in their Tesla with the windows all the way up and there's no way to get his positive pressure, right? And uh, they, then they get a lawyer. They're like, man, there's some money to be made here, right? So you're probably going to register. Everybody goes through, and, and you're going to get basic information on as many people. Somebody mentioned on a break, you know, a lot of states, you can, you can, they can get a device at the state level, and you can just scan their driver's license if they have one, and, and you can uh, pull in data into your program. So that's another option. Uh, the, the discharge station are typically non-RAD folks, just... Uh, uh, counseling, that could be, uh, you know, any medical or physiological or uh, psychological needs, and then sheltering, we talked about that. Okay, the next four slides, I'm going to have Lauren from the CDC come up because she developed this program. So, hi, my name is Lauren Finkley. I'm a nuclear engineer in the radiation studies section at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, I am the project lead, creator, developer of CRC Simpler. Um, I'm also the back-end data analyst, and I've gone to lots of community reception center exercises across the country. Um, we like to say if you haven't done a community ex reception center exercise with us, we're always collecting more data. And if you had fun, like me and Chris, then you'll keep signing up for more community reception center exercises. Um, so community reception, or CRC Simpler stands for Community Reception Center Simulation Program for Leveraging and Evaluating Resources. Um, so it is a throughput calculator. So those of you that are in power plant regions, um, it does calculate throughput. It is not going to equal what FEMA says because we calculate things a little differently. Um, and we also integrate that real timing data into the tool so we don't just have one standard time where it's, you know, um, a robot walking through a portal monitor. We have people who have wheelchairs, um, access functional needs, translation assistance, just asking questions. So it's a little bit more realistic. Um, and so one of the things we did with CRC Simpler was we wanted to make sure it would be easy to use by public health and emergency management. Um, and there's no end user cost. So it's completely free, it's online. Um, I'll pull it up in a second. And it has a lot of graphical outputs because we found that a lot of people, they're like, I don't have time to read all of this data. I just want to like make a decision. So it was really geared towards decision making, quick actions. Um, and it's flexible and scalable. So what you're going to see is version one. And in about a month and a half, we're actually uh, scaling up. So it's going to also include uh, pet monitoring and decontamination as well as vehicle monitoring and decontamination. Um, so CRC Simpler has uh, user inputs based off your population size, your shift lengths, and your resources at your CRC, and then it'll output that throughput, wait time estimates, sorry, it's really loud back here, um, station-specific resource utilization. So um, we can do what-if comparisons in the tool. So um, you can run an estimate, and then you're like, ooh, it's not working out so well. Um, so what if I add a little bit more registration? Um, so then you can uh, see it there as well. Um, 
So in this scenario, we had six lanes of registration at first um, for 1,000 people arriving with 25% contamination over eight hours. Um, and it shows that your extended time past your shift would be seven hours. So that's a lot of overtime. Um, and so we're like, okay, registration is the bottleneck, so we'll add more registration. Um, and then we get it down to two hours of overtime. Um, so this is kind of what the output looks like currently. So you have your, in the light blue, you have your original uh, estimate, and then you have in the darker blue your comparison. So we wanted to make sure you could see any improvements when you adjust resources at your CRC um, in these bar graphs. So I'm gonna very quickly open the tool. Ooh, this is gonna be fun, okay. So um, as you can see, it is online right now. So for those of you that do have internet access, um, you can access it and then we can always give you uh, the link. Um, so I will say the population monitoring guide is a little outdated and so it doesn't have CRC Simpler in it. We're currently updating it to have CRC Simpler. Um, there's a talk later in the week on Wednesday where I'll be talking about CRC Simpler um, and so happy to talk to anyone else about it. Um, but so here you have your information about your population arriving at your CRC, you have how long you're gonna be open, and then you can put in your resources. So how many portal monitors you have, um, you know, how many handheld detectors, showers, registration, things like that. Um, and then it does right now give you minimum staff. Um, in May, we're gonna allow you to adjust the staff, we're gonna allow you to adjust the registration form length because like Chris said, the CRC e-tool is a long form. And we know that not everybody wants to have a long form, so we worked on developing short, medium, long forms, both paper and electronic, and collecting times, that way you can see how these different adjustments will work. We're also gonna have different decontamination methods, such as um, showers, partial decon, and dry, and then um, We'll also have you know, several different amounts of contamination. So right now it's one, 25, and 50% contamination. So we're gonna increase that. Um, and then also we'll be having pets, service animals, vehicles in the next module, as well as access and functional needs. So we're adding a lot more functionality. Um, this is version one, but it'll be here soon. So um, the other tabs we have are summary outputs, which are those bar graphs I showed you. We have an hourly output tab, which shows you 24 hours, so that means um, you open your CRC, and then you can see what happens 24 hours after opening your CRC. And then for those of you that don't like graphs and you really like your tables, we have a data page where you can see everything in table form and export it to a CSV. Um, and then in May, you'll be able to export everything in a PDF, so you could share it with decision makers and make decisions in that way. So I'm going to turn it back over to Chris. So this is a summary. Uh, we talked about the purpose, the elements, the roles, uh, and documentation for all of I think one thing we should probably add is a slide. Uh, you guys know that everybody's going to RAD Responder. There is actually a input into RAD Responder if you have multiple reception centers operating that you can talk about how many people you put through each reception center so you can put all the data aggregated together for an event. Uh, so that's something else to look at. I would encourage all of you uh, to, to get bold and, and, and run a reception center in your community. And again, what's really nice is if you go to the CDC's website, they have, uh, they have everything you need to run a drill and exercise. They have the triage cards. Uh, they can help you with you know, what equipment and supplies you need. It's, it's unlike a lot of the exercises we plan, it's like a can program online to just download everything to set up a, and run an exercise. And if you want to do one and you want help, you can reach out to us or to especially the CC and they'll bring people in if they have the, the time that week and they'll help you run your exercise for you, which, which helps out you know, with training ahead of time. So do I have any questions on CRCs? Yes, sir. The, uh, this might be a question for Lauren. Um, the CRC is simpler. Uh, is there an existing app or an app in the works for that? It seems like it would be very appable. You want like a mobile application? Yeah. Uh, it really looks horrible on a mobile application, and the reason I say that is because if you think of all those graphs on your phone, like it's just, you're going to be zooming and touching, and it's just not going to work very well. So it should be on a tablet or on a laptop, um, but it is online right now. 
um, so you could access it. In that yeah, way. I was just looking out there. Yeah. So, okay. But on your phone, it's just not looking good. Yeah. Any other questions? <clears throat> All right. Oh, yes, sir. Yes. A couple of things. Um, about uh, contamination monitoring, about 20 years ago I had a heart stress test and uh, I had the equipment in the lab to monitor myself, just uh, usually we monitored other things. But uh, back then they gave me thallium 208 and technetium 99 for the radioactive isotopes. And I learned an awful lot uh, through that experience. Um, I went next door to where the RCTs were and they'd uh, monitor me just for kicks uh, more than anything. But uh, that was an internal dose to me and it was interesting to track that through my body. The thallium sticks around for about two weeks the Tech 99, you get about four, maybe five days max. Tech 99 is a beta emitter. Um, and uh, one of the things that I learned about radioactive people is they ooze radioactivity uh, through their sweat glands, through their pores. And so they're constantly contaminating everywhere where they sit, etc. And so if uh, you happen to know of somebody getting one of these tests, it might be a good test subject to run through your contamination monitoring program if you can get them to volunteer for that too. Uh, it's quite an eye-opening experience. I agree. Uh, so it, that would be uh, convenience monitoring, opportunistic, coincidental. Um, yeah, maybe even talk to the medical facility to see if you can get some patients that are going through those tests to, to help out on your, on your program, just to give you some good experience. So I'll summarize, uh, nuclear medicine patients, which there are millions a year now, uh, they are radioactive for a while and they will alarm meters, portal monitors, and so on, and they're good for training. Uh, and, and in fact, you could have somebody come to a population monitor center that alarms it and then but hopefully they were trained by their physician to tell people I just had a stress test and I, uh, you know, I, I could uh, I, I could emit some radiation. Sir, do you have a question about? I was just going to follow up on that. We, you know, I don't know how many people here with the Department of Radiological Health or whatever their state, um, but we've had several portal monitors in the state alert at landfills when you have a little yay diaper from a patient receiving radiation treatment. Oh. We yeah. have so yes. you got see you got the yeah, department right out digging the garbage so they find it. So. We have radioactive material in the at landfills every single week in Texas that we monitor, and they're from patients, they're from hospitals, they get into the sewage system, and so we just have to triage that and determine if it's short lived or long lived. Any other? Yes, sir. Uh, can we legally ask people if they've had a uh, nuke, if they're a nuke med if they set off an alarm? Well, I'm, I don't that's think that's been a it. debatable thing. I was curious. I don't think that's a lot of personal health information to ask somebody that, if they're concerned about their health and they come to a reception center, uh, you would think they would say something that, yes, I just got monitored. Well, I mean, the stress of the event, they may not think that's of right. it. That's right. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Some people, it might not occur to them. Because You're right. Of everything that's going yeah. on. Well, that's when you got it. That if that's that means they're going to be the internal contaminated and you're just going to have to keep asking questions to figure out what's going on uh, to determine that and hopefully that'll sh that'll eventually show up with that answer will show up any other questions what yes sir um, you mentioned about the what if uh, scenarios as you go through uh, various things um, I found another useful test is the so what test and uh, so what if this happens what do you do next so I found that uh, quite helpful in uh, everything that I do as well. All right. So not just what if, but so what. Yeah. Got it. Anybody else? What's, oh, yes, ma'am. Can you talk about best practices for vehicle monitoring? Best practices vehicle monitoring. I don't think that's in any of our presentations, but maybe we need to think about adding a few slides on that. Because uh, that's a good question. You know, people show up in their vehicles, 
and uh, we can do a lot of things with that. We, you know, we like they park over here. I, I will tell you this: in the in this in the situation I gave you that we dealt with in Harris County, 170 people that were contaminated. Uh, we went through monitoring. If they were if they were positive, they had contamination, then that was a trigger that we were going to monitor their vehicles. And so we asked them uh, to bring that vehicle there and monitor it. And in some of those cases, maybe not in a, a terrorist event, but in a, uh, if it's industry, then we would monitor their homes too. And they, so you have to follow up with that. And so, uh, th but that's a good question, yeah. Uh, there are a lot of, there's the best practices for what you quickly check, uh, like doorknobs, uh, foot pedals, uh, steering wheel, and uh, air filters. That's kind of a standard right there. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. So you all don't automatically monitor the vehicles? Only if the people are positive for contamination? I'm telling you the way we do it, yes. Uh, you, again, you got to go back to the scalable, flexible. If you monitor 10,000 people for a rheological event, you're not going to probably do 10,000 vehicles. Now, if somebody in your, uh, your county and city says, man, we got a problem, we got to be worried about vehicles, then maybe you're going to set up that also, right? Okay, because our, our typical protocol for a reception center is to be, monitor all the vehicles and How many people do you put through your reception center in your exercise? Oh, I haven't done one yet. <laughs> yeah. Is this for a power plant? Okay, two or three people probably. That's why. So you can do everything with two or three people, right? You could just get them down to background. Right. And again, anybody from FEMA in here? Okay, good. Again, you guys are evaluating. I mean, you, are, you are drilling to the checklist of FEMA. And what I'm telling you guys is when you walk out of here, you need to look at getting more people involved and, and look at the CDC's gold standard guidance on what you're going to do. All right? I'll say it's fun to do vehicles because it's fun to go into a Lexus and cut out a piece of leather because you can't get the cesium off of it. Anything else? All right, I'm, I'm talking too much here. <laughs>